Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Santiago Montero Mendieta. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about my PhD plan, which is entitled A Genomic View on the Diversification of Neotropical Frogs. And my main advisor is Carles here. Um, so, as you all may know, the theory of evolution is based on the idea that all species are related and they gradually change over the time. And the accumulation of uh, small changes can, can produce that some species get an old differentiation, sorry, some, species, some populations of the same species get an old differentiation that they will not be able to reproduce among uh, with, other, with other populations of the species anymore. So, when this happens, we say that it's speciation event, right? So, so what's a speciation? So the speciation, yeah, it's, I mean, it could be a very complicated uh, uh, topic, but I'm just going to say that is the formation of a new and distinct species in the course of evolution. And these are some of the mechanisms, uh, I'm not sure if there is more, but I think these are the main ones of, that can produce speciation in natural populations. So what I'm gonna, yeah, so what, what I want to say uh, is that uh, before, uh, speciation was, a study, uh, was mainly studied on, uh, on with using the speciation using geno uh, genetic resources was mainly studied in model organisms such as human and mouse. However, yeah, with the uh, yeah, uh, high frequency, high frequency sequencing techniques such as Illumina. Now, a speciation, it's possible. Uh, you can study also speciation in, in non-model organisms. And that's mainly what, what, yeah, that what we call speciation genomics. Um, so here, on this slide, I just wanted to, to say that before uh, using Sanger, Sanger sequencing, uh, we had to select some of some uh, specific markers, and we had to kind of believe that these markers were saying us the, the truth. But you know that some, it happens that sometimes the, the markers that you are using are not representing the, 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 the species, the real species tree. So with, gen with genomics, we don't give a shit about that. We just, <laughs> we just sequence everything, and, and we get everything, and then we can study things like yeah, yeah, we can find which are actually the genes that are involved in a speciation. And we can find genes that are uh, uh, involved on hybridization and also uh, genes that are Im involved on, on adaptation. Uh, and more, many more things, but i just here saying the more important things for my thesis. Um, so I'm going to use neotropical amphibians. And neotropical amphibians are uh, the 50% of the amphibians in the world. Uh, actually, there are many species that are being described every year and some others that become extinct. But the thing is that there are few studies that have applied uh, genomics to study um, the, the speciation processes in, in amphibians. And so still we don't know uh, what are the processes that build this uh, huge diversity of amphibians in the neotropical uh, regions. So our study model are the frogs, uh, a, a genus of frog called Oreobates, and this genus of frogs, it's uh, nobody is composed by 24 species. And the good thing about these frogs, they are not very cool because they are all uh, brown and yeah, but the good thing is that <laughs> they are distributed across a wide uh, range of habitats and attitudes. So you can find uh, these frogs living in cloud forest, uh, mountain forest, lowland forest, dry forest, they are all in South America, but very different habitats. So also there are some trees, but these trees are made only with one, two genes, so I don't believe these trees that much. And, and what, I want, what we want to do is to, to, to get the, the idea of what's going on here with these species. So also, yeah, we think that this is uh, one of the best non-model species that we could ever dream because there is a uh, species that have been uh, described but by only one uh, sample. Also, uh, they are extremely difficult to, to find. You can ask Carlos later about that. Uh, and, <laughs> and yeah, and 
what I was saying is that our, yeah, our collaborators here have been working with, with this species uh, by uh, the last 20 years. So we have access, like in blue you can see the species that our collaborator has described. So m m most of them have been described by our collaborators. And in green you can see the samples that we have available uh, in, yeah, from our collaborators. So we have something uh, that uh, not many people can have in the, in the world, I think, at least with this genus. So that's why we are using these, these frogs. Uh, so the research goals of my thesis, the main research goal is to study the evolution rates, demographic history, adaptation patterns and of, on the frogs of the genus Eurobates. And we have, I have to divide this in, I'm not going to say four, four chapters, but four stages because, you know, it can change. But the first stage would be to create a phylogenomics tree uh, to study the relationships among Oreobates. The second would be to study evolutionary history, which means a study variation in evolutionary rate. The third one would be uh, the demographic history, w in which we want to track demographic changes through time and the correspondence with habitat changes. And uh, f finally, f uh, it's about adaptation. We want to identify genes that are, have been differentiated between populations. I'm going to explain uh, these four stages into more detail in the next slides. And then I will present the meth some methods and results. Uh, so on the first stage, the phylogenomics, our idea is to build a highly supported tree for, uh, with using uh, genomics data, using genomic data. And with this tree, we, we will use it for downstream analysis, but also for to, to solve some questions that can be solved with, with a phylogen phylogeny. Which, for example, we know that there are species of Oriwate that uh, inhabit the, the highlands and the lowlands. So we want, to build a, a, we want to build a phylogenetic tree and we want to know what's happening here. I mean, we want to... The, the thing is that it has been hypothesized that, that Oriwades uh, uh, was originated on the highlands. So uh, that's not very, that's a little bit weird because, you know, normal species originate on the, low, on the lowland and then they go to the, to the highlands to conquer new, <coughs> conquer new habitats. Uh, but yeah, in our case, we want to know uh, yeah, where, uh, what's happening here, how many species and uh, how many colonization events and yeah, we can solve that with the uh, phylogenomics tree. So on the second stage, on the evolutionary history, we want to study the variation in the evolution rate of Oreobates. This uh, uh, previous, previous studies on our group here from Alvaro uh, have shown that, that in, in, in species that inhabit the, the highlands, the rate of evolution is lower, right? the evolution rate is lower. So we want to, but on the, on the study of Alvaro, this was not very clear, I, I think, because, at, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> it was, because it was quite clear for mit mitochondrial genes, but not for, for, for nuclear ones. So we want to use uh, genomics, we want to use all, all the genes, we want to know if this is, is true for all the, the genes. And so for that, we will use genomics. So we will want to know if, if for example, the, yeah, the evolution rate on the frogs that, uh, on the water frogs that inhabit the, the highlands is like uh, slower than the frogs that inhabit the lowlands. Uh, the third stage, the demographic history. So we want to study the eff effect of the past environmental conditions on the Oreobates demography. So so as you may know, uh, uh, the Andes, these frogs inhabit the Andes, sorry, I don't know if I would tell you. Uh, and the Andes was originated about 20 to 30 million years ago. So these frogs, as they were originated like because of, of that. Uh, it's has been hypothesized that also uh, was from, they are from this time. The thing is that the, the frogs that inhabit the, the highlands, they, uh, they are supposed that, that in the, in the glacial cycle uh, on the Pleistocene 2.5 million years ago, the, they have to, to uh, survive somehow. And, the, and it's hypothesized that, that 
the populations were increasing and decreasing following the, the glacial, glacial cycles. So we want to, to test if that's true, if the species of Orobates that, that, that inhabit uh, the highlands have different uh, populations, uh, uh, populations, populations, how, how, how do I say? Yeah, well, you don't, you don't understand what I mean. <laughs> if they have like different, uh, if the population has been changing differ differently from uh, on, uh, through the time compared to the species living on the lowlands. And the fourth stage is the uh, study of adaptation in which we want to study if, if there are regions that can uh, be different between <coughs> a species because of adaptation. So for example, this frog here, Oreobates cruralis, can be found in uh, I think up to three or four different types of habitats, so which includes like cloud forest, which is quite uh, high, and then also mountain forest and dry forest. So we want to know if the different populations have different have different uh, genome regions on the genome that are different because of adaptation to environmental. So our initial idea was to use uh, this kind of approach that, yeah, uh, it's quite adapted from our collaborators in Sweden, which is, because the problem is that we don't have, we don't have a reference genome in frogs. So we wanted to build a transcriptome uh, and then use it as a reference to do whole genome sequencing for the other uh, species. And then for, uh, for that, we, we, create, we, we would create an exome assembly, which is the, the transcriptome. The, uh, the transcriptome is the, the, the genes that are expressed, and the, the exome would be like uh, the genes and uh, the genes that are expressed and a little bit more. So the problem is that this study with, from our collaborators was quite good because it was on herring, so herring have uh, small genome sizes. Uh, on frogs, the, the, the problem is uh, the, the genome size is a problem because it's quite, uh, it can be quite big. So uh, we thought that this could be, uh, could be important to look at the, at the genome size. And we, uh, uh, we spent some time uh, at the beginning of my PhD looking onto, onto this. We, we tried to, to develop a method to, to uh, yeah, estimate the genome size in amphibians through real-time PCR. This was not very, yeah, we, was not a very conclusive uh, study, so we, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, but the thing, what I want to show with this uh, slide is that uh, on green here, you can see that the amphibians have very large genome size, uh, variation on the genome size compared to, to, compared to yeah, uh, the birds, uh, reptiles, and mammals, which are also vertebrates. So that's quite a problem. So we decided to use, instead of the whole genome, we decided to use the transcriptome which is like a reduced representation of the genome. So that's the methods how we are doing the, our, yeah, how we are doing the, the, the studies and everything. So the problem also with transcriptome is that if you want to do transcriptome sequencing, you have to you have, to have uh, you need to have uh, the tissues stored in RNA later or a buffer that it's very, very, good for, for keeping the tissue as, as it was at the beginning, uh, when we, it was collected. So the problem is that this is not always possible uh, to, to do, to, to in the field to do it, uh, because, uh, well, it re it's requires some things. But anyway, the problem is that, the problem is that we only had like very few uh, samples stored in RNA later, so we end up uh, that we only could do the experiments with one sample from one species. So that's quite a problem. But we decided to, to yeah, keep going with this. And we use uh, this approach that I'm showing you here, that which it's, uh, it basically is that from one sample, you sequence the, the, the transcriptome and you create a de novo transcriptome assembly. And after that, we have the, when we have the de novo transcriptome assembly, we use this to create a, a, some, uh, to, we use this to create a capture protocol experiment, which is something very novel, and, and yeah, uh, I will explain it later in the in the in the last slide. But the thing is that this allows us to have uh, 
the transcriptome for all the other species only from using only the transcriptome of one species at the beginning. So it's quite a good uh, technique. And with that, we could solve, hopefully, all the, the questions that I was talking at the beginning. So I'm also, I'm also showing you this here, which is the transcriptome workflow that I use uh, to create the de novo transcriptome assembly. I'm not going to talk about this uh, too much. I'm just showing this to, to so you can make sure that I'm working. <laughs> uh, and this is, the, uh, yeah, the thing is that we are going to, we will publish something probably uh, that will help other people to, to, to create uh, the novel transcriptome assembly. I think it could be quite useful. And yeah, here I'm just also showing you uh, like some results. So at the beginning with this, uh, with the sample, we started with a very um, a large amount of data, but then we end up with a, a data set about 18,000 genes. And from that, we created the, the, the experiment for the exon capture that I was talking before. So the thing is that, yeah, here I'm also showing that, yeah, uh, there are some results. And this is result uh, about the annotation. And the thing is that the, the, the transcriptome, the annotation, can uh, be different depending on the data set that you are using. So we detected that from the 18,000 genes, there are 18, uh, sorry, 10,000 genes that are autologous with Chernobyl tropicalis, which is, of course, if you add more species, then the, the autologous will be less. But that's the thing that you will use to build the phylogenies. So uh, also here, this slide is some transcriptome so results, which uh, I was interested in know which are the functions of the, uh, sorry, yeah, the categories, the gene ontology categories that are more uh, common in our transcriptome. And you can see like most of the genes are involved on cellular processes, also single organism processes binding, well, quite general functions. And uh, yeah, here with this slide, uh, yeah, that's the last about results. And I just wanted to show you that uh, it really depends a lot also, again, on the database that you are using. In our case, uh, we are working with a non-model species, so I had to use SwissProd, which includes uh, a lot of different uh, organisms. And as you can see, uh, the main here in this, here, the main hits here are from Homo sapiens, and uh, we are working with a frog, but that's uh, quite common because, I mean, on the database, uh, the most common thing is the Homo sapiens. So yeah, you will get the more hits depending on, on the database. So the last slide and what is next? So the next thing that we are going to do is what I was talking at the beginning. Well, actually, we are already working on this, but is to we, we built this transcript, the novel transcriptome assembly, then we give, gave this to a, to a company in the, in the States, and they, they built for us uh, something called uh, capture proofs. And these are just uh, DNA sequences that are complementary to our, to our transcriptome of, of, of reference. <laughs> so, so this means that we could use this molecular proof. This molecular proof will hybridize with the DNA of the other species of Oreobates. And with that, we, could, we, we, we will be able to have the, the transcriptome for, for, all, for all the other species. And with that, we will, uh, yeah, we will identify autologous genes and test for the initial hypothesis that I was talking about. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And I will take any questions if you have any.